So this is um, taking you on a trip. Um, I was wondering if these lights could go down slightly, just so that we can see some of the, the visuals a bit better, just a little bit. Um, so this is uh, the constellation of Orion, for those who know the sky. Um, this is a computer-generated image, image where the positions of the, the stars are known very accurately from the Hipparchos satellite. So the Hipparchos satellite is a satellite that was launched to measure uh, the distances and the positions of stars very, very accurately. So what we're doing is we're going to fly through this, and we're also going to listen to some interesting sounds that are occurring as we, as we fly through. <laughs> So we're flying through at about five light years a second, which is unphysical, but we can do it on computers. And we're flying towards this uh, star here, Delta Orionis, which is obviously in the constellation Orion. Here we have a nice red giant star, Betelgeuse, and Rigel, a blue supergiant. This is upside down for us here in the Southern Hemisphere. This is a Northern Hemisphere view. So what we're hearing is some of the sounds of the stars. These weird sounds that you're hearing are vibrations. They've been moved up in, up in a few octaves, but essentially they're the vibration modes of some of these stars that we're looking at, we're flying past. So Delta Orionis is 916 light years away. So relatively nearby in the scheme of things. And once we get to these more distant stars, we don't have information about some of their vibrations. So the soundtrack goes a bit quieter. So we're moving through. So it's unlike Star Trek, where as you zoom past at warp speed, the stars flare by in great streaks. We're actually seeing them here plotted, as I said, as it, with their accurate positions, as accurate as we can get with Hipparchos and also plotted according to their brightnesses and their colours as, once again, as accurately as we can get. Okay. So let me take us back to... my presentation tonight. So the title of my presentation is What if the Sun Had a Voice and What Could It Tell Us? And my mission tonight is to convince you that the sun and stars, uh, we can listen to them. They do have unique voices that we can listen to. And they can tell us by listening to the, the, the songs of the sun and the stars, we can get information that we can get no other way at all but by listening to the vibrations of these stars. So um, my, my research is uh, called The Music of the Stars. The Music of the Stars is a Marsden-funded project. And it's, uh, here we go, it's... Um, oh, uh, my daughter would hate this. Oh, uh, which is why oh, I put it in. Because, in actual fact, I'm more interested in the, in the stars of the music, of, not of the musical kind, of the astrophysical kind. And they make quite a different sound when we listen to them. So, they make these strange vibrations. These vibrations is, is what I'm going to convince you tonight is going to tell us about the interior structure of the stars in a way that we can get from no other um, observations. Okay, so what if the sun had a voice? What could it tell us? 
we're, what we want to see is we want to see below the surface. When we look at the sun, um, we can see a bright sphere. And obviously, it um, has had a tremendous influence on peoples down through the civilizations. It's been revered by ancient civilizations as the bringer of light and the bringer of life to our planet. Our planet sits in just the right place that life can survive on this planet. And ancient peoples were desperate to understand why the sun did what it did in the sky, why the seasons did what they did. It was very important to understand the seasons because their lives were governed by what happened in the seasons. And so people were desperate to keep track of things like, um, here we have a solar observatory in Peru, where you were keeping track of the sun's position at various times of the year uh, to try and understand the track of the sun as well as the moon and the planets as well. And here we have another solar observatory in Mexico where the sun's light comes down through a, a hole in the rock at certain times of the year. In China, they, um, this is uh, several uh, thousand years old, it's a, a, a clockwork mechanism that's trying to predict the lunar cycles and the cycles of the sun and the planets. Um, in order to predict them and make a model and trying to understand the universe around them. And so it was very important uh, for them to try and understand what the sun actually was. But to an astronomer, the sun is this. It's a star. It's the nearest star, and it's a common old garden variety star. It's the closest star to us, and so it's very, very important it's very important because we can see all sorts of surface details. We can see all sorts of things on the surface. We can see flares. We can see sunspots. We can see what's happening in a detail we can't see on any other star. You look at any other star through your telescope, and it's just a point of light. Even when you've got a very, very powerful <coughs> telescope, it's still just a point of light. And so we want to study the sun in great detail because the sun is going to give us clues to other stars. And it's also important because the sun has such a great influence on us. The solar weather, the flares, the heat and light that it gives us is very, very um, important to us in our civilization. But astronomers see this as a chance to study stars, study stars close up. Here's a nice close up star. It's the only one we can get a great picture of. We can see in satellites here and, and get a lot of information about the sun. And this is an image taken through a narrow band filter so you can see some of these details. One thing we'd like to see is we'd like to see below the surface. The sun is opaque. You can't see below the surface. Okay, so we'd like to see what's down below. And how can we do that? Well, this problem is nicely posed by Sir Arthur Eddington in uh, 1926 um, in a book called The Constitution of the Stars. And... When I was on study leave in 2008 and I was visiting a friend in Scotland, I sat down at his library and I just happened to pick up this book, as you do, um, The Constitution of the Stars, just for a bit of light reading. And he posed this question quite nicely about the opaqueness of the sun and the stars. And this was the first few sentences in the book. He said, at first sight, it would seem that the deep interior of the sun and stars is less accessible to scientific investigation than any other region in the universe. Our telescopes may probe farther and farther into the depths of space, but how can we ever obtain certain knowledge of that which is hidden behind substantial barriers? What appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within? So that's the first few sentences of this book. And um, the rest of it got quite heavy after that. But, but, um, but the first few sentences were quite intriguing, and it actually made me think about writing my Marsden grant, which I did while I was there, um, application. And it put, what he was wanting to come up with is was he was wanting to say that models, by modelling the physics of stars, we can detect and we can work out what the physical conditions are inside a star. But I'm hoping to convince you tonight that in actual fact there's another way, an observational way, that we can test what's actually beneath it. We can see the surface, but we can also detect and work out and make observations of these deeper layers. And we can do that with the science of astro-seismology. 
And this is the real music of the stars. Well, we pick up vibration modes from a star. These vibration modes depend on the internal structure of that particular star. So each voice, each star has a unique voice which depends on its internal structure. Okay, so let's skip back a few thousand years, 2,500 years, to when the Greeks were thinking about um, the, whole, the whole universe. They were thinking about music. They were thinking about numbers in particular. They were mad about numbers. They were thinking about music. They were thinking about science. They were thinking about philosophy and trying to work out the way that the, um, the, way that the world moved and the way that the earth moved. They were very interested in numbers and ratios, and they thought everything needed to have a harmonic sense. Everything needed to be in numeric ratios that were pleasing to the eye and to the ear. And so they did a lot of work on things like they worked out that if you had a piece of string that you were plucking and it formed a certain note, that if you halved the length of that string, you would get an octave difference between those two notes. They worked out that intervals that were pleasing to the ear were numerical ratios, very simple numerical ratios, that a fifth was a ratio of two to three, that a fourth was a ratio of three to four, very simple numeric ratios. They also looked at this in their um, architecture, and they looked at this in their astronomy as well. They looked at the motions of the, the, the moon and the planets and the sun, and they thought they should all be harmonic ratios. The whole heaven should be a new musical scale and a number. And Plato goes on to say that a siren sits on each planet who, who carols a most sweet song, agreeing to the motion of her own particular planet, but harmonizing with all the others. So they thought there were sp supposed to be harmonic ratios of the orbits of the planets, and that each one should be related in a harmonic sense. This led to the idea of the music of the spheres, or the harmony of the spheres. They thought that um, this harmonic nature should show through in the numbers, and the astronomy, and the music, uh, in all senses of the universe. A few thousand years later, we get to Copernicus, who turned the universe on its head a little bit by suggesting that it wasn't the Earth at the centre of the solar system, but it was the Sun. And so, rather than having the Earth with the planets and the Moon and the Sun going around it, we had the Sun at the centre with perfect circles of planets and orbits around the Sun. And this was uh, almost heretical. Um, suggestion that the sun was actually at the centre of the universe, or the centre of the solar system. And he was very nervous about suggesting this. Uh, and, but one thing that stuck was still that there were perfect circles and perfect spheres, the crystalline spheres, uh, still won through after several thousand years. Next we move on to Kepler. Kepler had a lot of visual data from Tycho Brahe, who, who took the visual observations. And Kepler was trying to work out from these visual observations what were the orbits of the planets. And he tried to, because there were uh, the, the known planets, there were a certain number of known planets and there were a certain number of solids um, that were known, he, tried, he thought that there was a harmonic sense to the model of the universe and he tried to nest his orbits of the planets inside spheres and inside cubes and inside pyramids so that there was a harmonic sense to the orbits of all the planets. And so, in his writing, he also shows this by having key signatures for the different planets, that there would be different, res that would be different resonances because the orbits are going at different rates, and so they go at different tones. Now, Johannes Kepler was a great mathematician. After 10 years of trying to work out this idea about the solids within spheres within other solids, and it not working, he threw the idea away and says, it's not working, I'll try something else. And he actually came up with the idea, the, th the three Kepler's laws that we have today, the Kepler's laws of planetary motion, where you have that the orbits of the planets are not circles, but they're ellipses. And it <coughs> fitted the data wonderfully, particularly because he's trying to do Mars, which has an elliptical orbit first. So the orbits of the planets are ellipses going around the sun, they go faster when they're closer to the sun and they go slower when they're further away. And if you take the orbital period of a planet and you square it, 
you plot it against the cube of the semi-major axis, which is the distance that the planet is away from the sun, then you get a straight line. And he called this his harmonic law. And it sort of harked back to the idea of the harmony of the spheres, because there was a relationship between the period of the orbit and how far away you were from the sun. And so even though he'd thrown away a lot of the ideas of crystalline spheres, he still kept the idea of this harmonic law in this particular third law. Okay, so let's uh, go on uh, and look at uh, how people try and imagine what the universe looks like. And here we have a nice uh, sketch. It's uh, of someone who's looking at the crystalline sphere that has the fixed stars on it. And we have the sun here, but they're trying to understand what's the clockwork mechanism behind it. Why does it do what it does? Why does the sun rise and set in a certain way? Why do the planets work in a certain way? And so I quite like this figure because behind what you can see, there's a reason. There's a, uh, a pattern. And by understanding those patterns, looking at those patterns, we can understand the workings of the universe. Okay, so humans are generally visual creatures. We look at things, this presentation, in fact, has all been fairly visual. Essentially, we're seeing as believing. We like to see something, and then we'll perhaps we'll believe it. Maybe not with all the special effects these days, but... Very, very visual creatures. But if you talk to, uh, talk to your dog or your or cat or various other animals, they don't necessarily live in a visual world. In particular, dogs, if you're taking your dog for a walk, it's a very smelly world to a dog. Their sense of smell is very acute. And I'm sure if you looked at a dog's brain and what they thought about, half of their brain will be thinking about what they see visually and half their brain will be thinking about what they're smelling. <coughs> because they're always smelling stuff. So scent is very important to animals and to dogs and to um, uh, other animals. Also, another sense that's important is sound. If you talk to a bat, if you look at a bat, it echolocates by sound. If you, talk to a, if you look at what dolphins and whales do, they navigate through sound. So sound is very important. And to them, um, sound is a very... Uh, the world is a very um, is based around what they can perceive through the sense of sound and hearing. So, can you see with sound? Well, here's a good illustration of how you can. This is an ultrasound of a fetus. So, this is not a picture. It's not a visual picture, but it's reconstructed from sound waves. And so, you can see that what we can we can resolve a lot of detail of the fetus from looking at the reconstruction of the sound waves as they're passing through someone's body. So because this talk is about sound, the music of the stars, we want to understand a little bit more about what sound is. So sound is, and what we're looking at, in stars, stars are gaseous. They're made of gas, and so we're going to be looking at gases. So if we have uh, gas molecules, and we have here a piston that's moving back and forth, uh, this can be a speaker, then we can see that sound waves are the propagation of these, um, these pulsations through this sound medium. So the, the atoms are moving in response to this piston that's moving, okay, this speaker that's moving. And so we can listen to this, and we can see that the atoms are squished together, they're compressed, and they're rarefied. So this is a compression wave. Sound wave is a compression wave. I speak to you. The air is being compressed and rarefied as it comes towards you. It's a pressure wave. So if we have more frequent collisions, we get a faster sound speed. And to get this, we can raise the temperature. If we raise the temperature, we get a higher sound speed. So a hotter star will have a faster sound speed inside it. Also, if we have lighter gases, we have faster sound speed. And I could show this to you, and you may have done it yourself at a kid's party if you take a huff of a helium balloon, and then you speak, you sound like a chipmunk. It's because helium is very light gas. When I'm speaking now, I'm speaking, and the sound waves are moving through oxygen and nitrogen. They're quite heavy compared to helium. So if you speak uh, through helium gas, then you'll get a much higher sounding voice. 
So what is the range of human hearing? Well, for a relatively young person, it's about 30 hertz to 18,000 hertz, I believe. So one cycle per second is one hertz, uh, and we say HZ for one hertz. So that's the normal range for, um, for human hearing. And I know a number of teenagers, I've talked to my sister-in-law, who's a high school teacher, she says, kids know this. You lose your hearing at these high frequencies as you get older. And so you don't hear so well these very high frequencies. Teenagers know this. They have ringtones on their cell phone that are so high pitched they can hear them, but the teachers can't. Teachers hate it, so they confiscate all the cell phones. But um, yeah, I've heard that was quite a common occurrence before um, the teachers realised what was happening. OK, so bats echolocate at 50,000 hertz. That's too high for us to hear. So sometimes you hear, if you've ever seen a bat and it's come out of a cave, and you can hear, sometimes you can hear a slight squeaking, but only at the very periphery of your sound. So they may sound something like this. Hopefully this will work. Okay, if you could hear it, that's what they would sound like. So what have I done there? You can't hear that, but I've taken a measurement device that has recorded the bat sound, and then it's lowered the frequency down to the audible range. So essentially you're hearing what it might sound like if you could hear up at that range but of uh, taking it down to a range that you can hear. So dolphins and blue whales sing at very low frequencies. So sometimes you can hear them, 12 to 200 hertz. So there's various chirps, buzzes and rasps. So these very low frequencies travel long distances, which is what you need when you want to talk to your mate who's a long way away through the ocean. And so they've adapted um, those navigation and that communication so that that can take place. So when we look at a graph of the frequency, so this is where human hearing can take place, the whales are way down at these low frequencies, the bats are way up at these high 50,000 hertz frequencies that you can't hear, and the stars are very low frequencies, way down in this direction. They have um, much lower frequency than even whales. So if you can believe a bat sounds like what I played, and if you can believe that a whale sounds like that, and all I've done is shift the frequencies up and down by a few octaves, then I can play you some sounds of the stars and that will be what they sound like, but just shifted, as I said, by an octave or two or ten, so that you can hear them in the, vis in the, in the audible range. Okay, so what I want to talk about next is, after talking about sound and human hearing, is to talk about uh, the physics of oscillations in stars. So let's first of all have a look at some simple oscillations. We'll look at one-dimensional oscillations. So we're going to look at a guitar string or a violin string. So this is what Pythagoras was interested in looking at, these various harmonic ratios. So here we have the fundamental, where you have a node at each end, and that doesn't move. And then in the centre, you have an anti-node, and that's where the amplitude is the maximum. So something like the fundamental mode is where you have the amp uh, a single node at each end, and an antinode in the middle, and you have that string vibrating. That's low frequency. That's the lowest frequency you can get out of that string. But you can get other modes as well, modes with an M rather than an N. You can get something called the first overtone, and that's where you have a node at each end, but you also have a node in the center too, so that the wavelength is shorter, and the frequency here is higher. So we have here, you have a node, a node, a node, and you have two antinodes here with a certain amplitude. Then we go to the second overtone, and we have two nodes here, and so we have 
the shape of the wavelength looks like this. And we can even go to the fourth, uh, the third overtone, which has one, two, three, four nodes. Okay, so that's one-dimensional oscillations on a string. You can also look at one-dimensional oscillations on something like uh, a baseball bat or a cricket bat. This, in fact, is a baseball bat. So if you look at the natural way that this wants to vibrate, it looks something like this. And you'll know this, that if you've been out playing softball or been out playing cricket, that if you hit the ball at a certain place, it feels good and the ball races off. But if you hit it on the bay at the the very tip of the bat, you can set up a, a, a vibration throughout the bat that is really quite painful when you're holding it. So there's naturally, there's this, what they call a sweet spot where, um, where it's the best place to hit it where you don't set up these vibrations to take place throughout the bat. We also have um, something interesting in terms of the harmonic. So when you listen to um, an orchestra tuning up, you will have heard, um, you will have heard, they usually start off with the oboe. I think it's because the oboe is the hardest thing to tune. So they get the oboe to play an A. And then everyone else takes over and they start tuning, the violins start tuning to A and all the other uh, instruments start tuning to A, which is 440 hertz. Now the harmonics are very, uh, are very um, important in this because when you listen to the instruments, they have different sounds. And I have a, a little demo for this because I've brought a couple of instruments along. So if we have a flute and we play an A, the flute has a certain number, it has a certain frequency response. It's playing A, so it's playing 440 hertz. Okay, so it's playing the same note as the oboe, hopefully, is playing. But it sounds quite different to playing the same note on the clarinet. And that's because of the frequencies that are present, the harmonics that are present. Even though they're playing the same A, they're playing the same 440 hertz, the frequency content is different. So you've got the dominant frequency here is the strongest. That's what you're hearing. But the richness of the tone that comes out and the way that the tone sounds depends on how many of these harmonics and how strong they are. And that's why the clarinet and the flute sounds quite, uh, sounds quite light and, uh, and breathy, while a clarinet sounds has a quite a different tone. And it all depends on this thing called timbre, which is the, the harmonic content, how many of these overtones you have, and how strong they are compared to the primary frequency. So if you have just a simple tone, it sounds very, very electronic. It's not particularly pleasant, just a single sinusoid. So if you have a single, um, a single frequency here, you get a very tinny sounding, very electronic sounding uh, sound. So when you listen to an orchestra, the way that the instruments sound depends on this harmonic content. Now we can move to the next um, dimension. We can look at two dimensions. And when you look at two dimensions, we can see uh, a good example of two dimensions is something like a drum. So the oscillations that you can set up on the surface of a drum. So here we have radial modes. These are called radial modes because when you look at them, they're the same as you go round in a circle. So they keep, um, they, they keep their spherical um, shape when you look at these. So these little movies will show you um, what the fundamental looks like. So you have a, the fundamental mode as it goes up and down. It has an antinode in the centre. That's where the maximum amplitude is. And then round the outside is where the node is. So it's rather than being a dot on your string, a point on your string, it's actually a circle. Okay, so the circle round the outside is your node, and then your antinode is bumping up and down here in the centre. 
So we can see that here. So it bumps up and down here. The first overtone has a node. Once again, it's a circle, because this is a radial mode that's symmetric around in a circle. We have a radial, we have a node, which is a circle here, and then the central peak pops up and down on this first overtone mode in two dimensions. And then the second overtone has two circular nodes, to two circles where there's no motion, and then the motion in the centre once again goes up and down. So these are radial modes, they're radially symmetric about the centre of this drum. The drums don't tend to oscillate that way. This is a very, these modes are damped in actuality. So you tend to get more complex modes for drums. And here we have two non-radial modes. Non-radial means they're not radially symmetric, they're not the same as you go round in the circle. And so you can imagine the one on the left, this is a dipole mode. You can see a node here, it's quite hard to see, it's a line where there's no motion, and then the other sides go up and down around that line of where the node is. This one is a quadrupole mode, which means there's two lines that go through the centre, and so there's two sides are going up, and then the other two sides are going uh, up, down as this one goes up and down. So this one goes up, down, up, down, while this one goes down, up, down, up. So for drums we get um, oscillations that are set up in this way. And so these are, one, these are modes that you actually see or actually hear when you're playing the drums uh, and you get rather a number of different possible modes that can actually happen on a drum. You can also get 2D oscillations on a violin. A violin is designed um, especially to enhance the harmonics, to make the tone as rich as possible, so that when you're playing on the strings, the body, the cavity resonates at certain nice harmonics to make the sound richer. And of course, that's an art form, it's not a science, so the people like Stradivarius who could do this um, were very sought after in terms of making a violin that sounds as rich and as pleasant as possible. So here, a violin body has been set up, and they've put carbon dust on the back of it, and they've suspended the violin in space with, with, some, with some strings. And what they've done then is play a frequency. And if the, if the violin oscillates at that frequency, then the carbon dust will all jump off at the antinodes and it will sit there at the nodes. And so here, where the carbon dust is, is sitting, for instance, this one has quite a complex structure where the node is. Okay, where there's no motion. Where the antinode is, where, where the, uh, the resonance of this uh, violin body is jumping up and down, then it shakes off the carbon dust. So you can see, depending on what frequency is being played, you get a whole lot of different, whole lot of different harmonics enhanced by the shape of the violin body. So the violin body is, is, is oscillating in certain specific frequencies, enhancing those harmonics. Okay, let's move through now to stars, finally, in three dimensions. So here we have a three-dimensional structure. These are radial modes. A lot of stars pulsate in radial modes. And here on the right, you can see, we can see into the interior structure. So this is a radial mode because it keeps its spherical symmetry. It stays spherical throughout the pulsation. It gets bigger and smaller, sort of in a breathing motion, but it stays spherical. Okay, it doesn't change its shape. Okay, so let's play this one here. And as it gets bigger and smaller, there's some motion of the star towards the core and there's some motion of the star outwards. The star also gets hotter and colder as it gets smaller and larger. <coughs> it also puts out more light and less light as it gets bigger and larger too. So we can see the light output changes, we can also see that the temperature changes, and we can also see that the star's surface is coming towards you and going away from you. So there are a number of different things that are happening here for the radial mode. These oscillations are often quite large. The stars often double in size and get smaller. 
by just as much. But there are also non-radial modes in stars, and these are the modes that I'm interested in. These are modes where the star has uh, certain uh, ways of moving that are quite distinct. So in this case, one hemisphere is moving down while the other one's moving, one's moving towards the core while the other one's moving away from the core. And then, um, and then, so it has this bouncing sort of motion that you see. Also, we have temperature changes and we have motion of the surface. If we go and look at uh, some other non-radial modes, this one here is uh, a mode that has two circles around it, two circles that are parallel to the equator. And so the star is stretching and squishing and stretching and squishing as it pulsates. Okay, and that's, um, we can see that the temperature changes and the shape of the star changes and the velocity of the surface changes. And in this one, this one's more like a surface wave. So the wave is more like a water wave moving around the surface of the star. The star looks like it's rotating. In actual fact, it's not rotating, it's the wave itself moving around the star. So when we look at real stars, we can listen to instruments and often the nice chords that we hear are harmonic. So if we're listening to a nicely tuned instrument or a nicely played chord, we often get nice sounding harmonious chord of various notes. But in stars, they have frequencies, a number of different frequencies, but they're not necessarily harmonious. They're not necessarily twice the frequency in two to three or these nice even ratios. They're not harmonious, harmonious to the ear. They sound dissonant, they don't sound pleasant as, um, as a nicely tuned instrument does. And that's just reality, that stars are not generally harmonious. But uh, I have a colleague, Zoltan Kolath, from Hungary, who has found a star. He found a Cephe that has a nice harmonic um, set of frequencies that actually sound relatively pleasant when you listen to them. So in this case, he's put together a Bach tune, but it's not played with a normal instrument. This is played with the frequency or the frequency harmonic spectrum of a particular star. Okay, so when you look at the, the frequencies and the harmonics that are present here, they're all the ones that the star has in its frequency spectrum. And that's why it's called a sea feed horn. It does sound quite horn-like. So we'll stop it there. It sounds a bit different than you would normally have heard Bach play. But sea feeds are really interesting stars. They're really, really important stars for astronomers. And the reason for that is that the, they are these um, radially pulsating stars that have a particular property. And this particular property was discovered by Henrietta Leavitt in uh, almost, well, uh, more than 100 years ago now, in 1908. She was looking at a nearby galaxy. I shouldn't realize it was a nearby galaxy. She thought it was a nearby cluster of stars. And she saw, um, she saw a number of these CFED variables, and they're pulsating away. They're getting bigger and smaller in a very regular way. CFEDs are very important because of how regular their pulsations are. And she found that the brighter variables have longer periods. So the brighter variables are the bigger stars. They have longer periods or deeper tones. The shorter, the shorter period C feeds are the smaller stars, the ones that have the higher tones. So the small ones have the higher tones, the bigger C feeds have the lower tones and the longer periods. And it's all to do with the physical structure of the star. And so when she had a look at the light curves, which is what the light looks like as it changes with time, so here's the brightness of the star with time, she saw that the sea feeds had a certain period. And when you looked at a number of different sea feeds, that the short period sea feeds were the small ones and they weren't particularly bright. They were only 100 times the brightness of the sun. But the ones that had a period of 100 days, 
they were 10,000 times the brightness of the sun. And there was a linear relation, well, there was a relationship between the period and the luminosity. And this is very, very important. That means if you measure the period of a sea feed, you know immediately how intrinsically luminous it is. So you measure the period to be 10 days, you immediately know it's a 1,000 times the luminosity of the sun because that's what's in intrinsically, that's what its luminosity is based on its pulsation period. So then you can go out and have a look at it in the sky and say, well, how bright does it look? And if you compare how bright it looks with how intrinsically much energy it's putting out, you can get the distance to that star. So we call these things standard candles. That's because from an observational property like the period, we can get an intrinsic property of that star and then get something very difficult to measure like the distance. So normally stars, you can look out and you can see its position very easily, at X and Y coordinates, there it is. But how far away it is, that's one of the most difficult things to do in astronomy, is to measure how far away a star is. Because it could be bright because it's close, or it could be bright because it's actually a very intrinsically bright object, but it's still a long way away, you can't tell. So that ability to measure distances is very important and why sea feeds are very important. So this is a, a very important guy, Edwin Hubble. They named a telescope after him. In 1923, he found a sea feed in a nearby galaxy, a nearby galaxy of Andromeda. Andromeda is two million light years away. He found this variable star in Andromeda. He recognised it was a sea feed. And so from knowing the period of the sea feed, knowing how intrinsically bright it had to be, and measuring how bright it appeared to be on his photographic plate, he could work out the distance to Andromeda. And there was a big hoo-ha going, a big debate going on in the 1920s about was the galaxy, was the Milky Way the only thing in the universe, or was there more stuff out there? And there's a big debate going on. And this thing here, these galaxies, were called spiral nebula at the time because people didn't know if they were nearby or if they were far away. And Edwin Hubble's measurement of the seafood showed that the Andromeda galaxy wasn't a nearby spiral dust cloud. It was actually a whole nother galaxy a long, long way away. And suddenly the universe became a much bigger place because they could work out the distances to nearby galaxies, galaxies by looking at these sea feeds and by working out how big the universe really was and from this period luminosity law. And it's interesting to note that um, this is a Hubble Space Telescope picture, um, uh, interesting <coughs> enough. And so here's Hubble's original plate and here's the Andromeda galaxy again. And with his, uh, his sea feed here is somewhere buried in here. Oh, it must be circled there. So it was quite interesting that when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, one of the major, one of the major um, key projects, one of the reasons they were launching Hubble was to study sea feeds. They wanted to work out the distances to nearby galaxies. It's still important because the more accurate you get those distances to the local galaxies, the better you understand the universe as a whole. And so the Hubble Space Telescope, essentially one of the key projects, one of the key reasons it was launched was because of this sea feed um, uh, period luminosity law and being able to understand distances. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is sound waves and the Doppler shift. So this is something you should be quite familiar with when, if you have any boy racers racing past you. If you have a stationary object and it's giving off sound waves, then those sound waves have a certain frequency and there's a certain distance between wave crests. But if their object's moving, then the crests are squeezed up in the direction that this object is moving. So if it's a car, the sound waves are squished up if the car's moving towards you and so the frequency is higher. And if it's going past you, the sound waves are stretched out and the tone's lower. So if you have any little kids and they're playing with their cars, they go, meow. So the tone is high when the car is coming towards you, and it goes lower as it goes past you. And that's just the Doppler effect. So we've got that for sound, and you can hear that. 
by listening to a microphone, if it's still going to work. Oh yes, here it is. So this has a particular tone, I can change the tone, but that's annoying enough. Okay, so you can hear that it has a tone. So that's because it's stationary, it has a single tone. If I move it in a circle, and try not to take out the, the Dean of Science here, you'll hear the frequency changing. As it comes towards you, you should hear a higher frequency, and as it goes away from you, it should go lower. So you should hear a wobble. Can you hear a wobble? Good, good, good. That's what it's supposed to do. Okay, so that's what happens to sound. That also happens to light. And so if we look at a spectrum of light, oh, that's shock waves. That's going when you go really fast. If you go um, and look at a spectrum of light, which is you take white light and you put it through a prism and you get a nice spectrum of red, yellow, orange, green, blue, violet, get a nice spectrum like this, and you get certain uh, pieces of the spectrum, certain colours are missing um, in a spectrum when you look at it. If it's from the sun, these dark lines, these absorption lines, are due to absorption by atoms or ions in the, um, in the atmosphere of the sun. So in the sun has hydrogen, so hydrogen is absorbed in the atmosphere, and so we don't see that red light because the sun has already absorbed it. And so you get the spectrum with these dark absorption lines corresponding to where certain frequencies or certain colours are actually missing from the spectrum. So here we have sodium. Sodium absorbs in orange, and so those two orange, line, orange frequencies are missing. <coughs> so this is what we call a spectrum. When we have the Doppler effect applied to light, just like the frequencies of sound are squished up and become higher when something's moving towards you, we get that um, with light too. So here we have an unshifted spectrum going through from blue to red with the absorption lines on it. If we have the object moving away from us, the light's stretched out and it's red shifted, and so all the spectral lines move a little bit to the red. And if the object's moving towards you, the light's blue shifted, and so all the absorption lines are shifted slightly to the blue. And so from looking at absorption lines in a star, we can work out if that star's moving towards you or away from you. And if it's a pulsating star, it will pulsate towards you and away from you and towards you and away from you. And if it does that in a periodic way, then you've got a fairly good handle on what's actually happening in terms of the size of that star. So you can work out this pulsation in terms of this velocity. So the faster it's moving, the bigger the shift. And that's a measurement we can easily make. Okay, so getting on to listening to the stars finally. So how do we actually listen to the stars? We don't get out there with a big ear and trying to listen to the sounds of the stars. Because even though the, sound, the sounds of the stars are real, there's sound waves moving through the stars, we don't detect them by listening to the sound because sound doesn't travel through space. Sound doesn't travel through a vacuum in space. No one can hear you scream, as the Alien movie said. What we're actually trying to do is we're looking at the sound waves as they propagate through the star and then we detect the small motions on the surface of the star in response to those sound waves. So this is very much like the seismology part of astro-seismology. So this is seismology of the Earth. When you have an earthquake, it sends certain shock waves, S waves and P waves, through the Earth. And depending on the interior structure of the Earth, these waves are refracted or reflected or actually pass straight through the core. Exactly the same thing happens with stars, except they're made of gas, and so the sound speed is different. But in, in stars, we get exactly the same effect. We get short wavelength waves propagating around the outside of the star, and longer wavelength waves propagating down towards the centre of the star. So observationally, what we see is as the star gets bigger and smaller, 
it gets hotter and colder, and it's also moving towards you and away from you and towards you and away from you. So we can measure the light curve. We can see how it gets brighter and fainter. Or we can measure the spectrum. And from the spectrum, those shifting of the spectral lines tells us that motion. It tells us if, if the star's coming towards you or away from you. And by measuring that, we get the measurement of these surface vibrations. So a light curve looks something like this, brighter and fainter with time. Whereas the surface distortions, if it's pulsating back and forth, it's wobbling about, we get these surface vibrations affecting the shape of the spectral line. So the line profiles, those spectral line profiles, they shift back and forth, but they also distort, they also make this weird shape depending on exactly what kind of mode we have going on in our star. And just to complicate things, stars don't pulsate with just one single mode. They actually have lots on top of each other. So if we look at different modes and what spectral lines you get, here we have one, two, three, four, five different modes. Um, some of these are, this is a simple radial mode, and this is a complicated mode that actually cuts the stars up into lots of different sectors as the wave travels around the outside of the star. So the spectral line in this one's simple, it just moves back and forth. It keeps us more or less the same shape. It sort of goes a little bit skew, but the other ones look quite strange. Some of them have bumps going from side to side. Other have bumps moving through the line profile. So this is essentially what we do when we make our observations. We observe the line profiles, and the way they change matches the mode that the star's vibrating at. And we can make models. And this is a model that my students have made that shows you what the line profile should look like as they change with time for different pulsation modes. Okay, and so this is what they're trying to observe. So they go, I send them off down to Mount John. They go down to Lake Tekapo to our observatory down there. And they make observations with the one metre telescope, which looks something like that. And that was built in the department in 1987. And we use a spectrograph here, which is designed and built in the department. Here we have Stuart um, lining up some of the optics in this Hercules spectrograph, Hercules, because it's so big. And so we take measurements of the spectrum, and here we have a solar spectrum taken from Mount John. And you can see all the nice colours, you can see all the spectral lines. And so we take numerous spectra, we study those spectral lines, and the way the spectral lines shift and distort then tells you the pulsation mode. And so finally, you get to look at the voices. You get to look at the frequencies of what that star's actually doing, okay? So when we look at the sun, this is a picture of the sun with one of the particular modes that the sun's oscillating with. So finally, we get to see inside the star. We see a certain frequency, and for the star, like the sun, we can work out it has a central temperature of about 15.4 well, million degrees. It has a certain central density. It has a certain central um, pressure. And if those were different, we would see different frequencies. So by measuring the frequencies, we can define what the internal structure of the sun is. And so here's a frequency spectrum. <coughs> and the observational sound of those frequencies for the sun's five-minute spectrum. So it has oscillations every five minutes. And this is due to the boiling motion in the, in the outer layers, the sound waves going throughout the outer layers of the sun. And the sun has now about two million frequencies measured. This is just a sample of them. So from these, we can tell some really interesting internal, uh, internal properties of the sun. We can work out that the sun is rotating at a certain rate. So here we have a cut through the sun. This is the equator, and this is the pole. And this is, um, or is it the other way around? We have <coughs> days, 25 is here. So we have 25 days, which is at the equator, so the sun is spinning quite fast at the equator. But when you look up at the pole, it's taking almost 35 days to rotate. So it doesn't rotate like a rigid body. It's what we've 
it's got what we call differential rotation. Faster at the equator and slower at the poles. And that means that the, the, the sun gets quite mixed up in its, in its, um, <coughs> when we look at the outer layers as it rotates. And this causes weather on the sun. So here we have a solar minimum moving through to a solar maximum. So this is five years difference. This is a solar maximum. We have lots of magnetic activity, lots of space weather, because the sun's giving off lots of charged particles. And the reason for that is the magnetic dynamo. This is what the differential rotation does. If you drop some magnetic field lines down through the sun, it's rotating faster at the equator, it spins up those magnetic field lines. It takes them from being vertical to being horizontal and then gives us a huge spaghetti mess of magnetic field lines. And this is what the sun's magnetic field looks like at the moment. We're at a solar maximum. There's lots and lots of magnetic field lines in very twisted, contorted shapes. Lots and lots of solar flares. Lots and lots of uh, uh, solar radiation, charged particles given off, which come and hit the Earth and cause aurora as they interact with the atmosphere of the Earth. So from astro-seismology of the sun, we can understand this internal structure. We can understand how big the core is. We can understand what the rotation is like right around the core. We can understand what happens to the magnetic field lines and what happens to the pulsations, these sound waves, as they move throughout this outer convective zone. When one of these magnetic field lines breaks and gives us one of these big flares, it comes towards the Earth. And thankfully, we're protected by the magnetic field of the Earth. If we weren't, we'd be in a dangerous situation. But we have a magnetic field protecting us. Those charged particles are funneled down to the North and South Pole, where they cause the aurora. There's also uh, observations of nearby stars. These are stars very much like the sun. This is Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is very similar to the sun, except it's a binary star. Both, both stars are quite similar to the sun, and these are their frequencies. Very similar to the sun, but their frequency spectrum is slightly different. It's unique because it has a unique set of frequencies that tells us about their interior structure. So what happens to the sun as it ages? As it ages, it starts off as the normal sun. As it runs, it fuses hydrogen to helium in its core. Then it turns into a red giant, becomes big and red and cool with a very hot core. That core is now turning helium into carbon. That's its fuel source. That's all the nuclear reactions that the sun can do. Once it runs out of helium, it will turn into a planetary nebula or blow most of its matter off into space. And the hot core of carbon will be left behind. That's a white dwarf star. It's a dead star. There's no fusion reactions taking place. It's a dead, cool, it's a dead hot star. It's the core of this sun. And that's what hap will happen to the sun in about 5 billion years. So nothing too much to worry about. But it's a, it's a hot carbon core. This is what a red giant sounds like, one of those big, red, cool stars. There's lots of boiling and convection going on. It has a very complicated spectrum. And here we have a computer model of what's happening on the surface of the star. It'll be about two to 400 times its current size as a red giant the sun will be. It will envelop Mercury. It will envelop Venus, it will envelop the Earth, and it will be about 400 times its current size. It looks something like this, and it will sound something like that. Once it pops up, puffs up its outer layers into a planetary nebula, it looks quite pretty, the hot core will be left behind. That's a hot core of carbon. That's the remainder of the star. About once, if it was one solar mass, it won't be. Our sun will turn into about half a solar mass carbon white dwarf. But 
If it um, had one solar mass of material, it would be about the same size as the Earth, but with one whole solar mass of material. So it's hugely, hugely dense. Very, very, very dense. And so it's got a huge gravity. The escape velocity is two uh, hundredths the speed of light close, much bigger than what we get on the Earth. So it's about the same size as the Earth, but incredibly dense. And it's made of carbon. It's under high pressure. It's under, what happens to carbon under pressure? Yeah, yeah. is anyone a diamond ring? It turns into a crystalline structure. So a diamond structure made of carbon with a, this sort of tetrahedral uh, structure. Um, so the, the nursery rhyme, which is actually quite old, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, up above the world so high, like a diamond in the, star, in the sky. Actually, it's true. These white dwarf stars have a crystalline carbon structure, very similar to diamonds in their core. And so... Um, yeah, you wouldn't mind one that size, would you? That would be quite good. So what do these sound like? These are very small. Very small, dense stars with incredible gravity. Their frequencies are very, very high. They pulsate every few seconds. Not years, not months, not days, but seconds. Here's another one. Okay. And near in the end. This is a weird star. This is a magnetic star. It's got a rotation axis and a magnetic axis at an angle. And so as it rotates round, you get, actually it sounds like the Doppler effect. You get this beating because the magnetic field sweeps round as the star rotates. And so you can see the star sort of wobbles from side to side. It's what the light curve looks like. And that's what generates the sound. Finally, we have a symphony of stars. This is Zoltan, again, Kolath from Budapest. This is an old star cluster. These stars are all very old. They all have a similar frequency, but when you add them together, you almost get this symphony of sound of the stars all pulsating with slightly different frequencies. And you can see here, he's indicated which ones are pulsing by showing them getting brighter and fainter in the picture too. Okay, I'm going to finish up by talking very briefly about the Kepler satellite, named after Kepler, of course. This is a satellite to look for other planets around other stars, and it does that by the transit method. We've just had the transit of Venus, where you saw Venus move in front of the sun. Well, you did if you had a special, you know, one of these solar viewer things. So Kepler does the same thing. It looks at the same place in the sky and takes thousands and thousands of observations of thousands and thousands of stars and tries to look for little dips as planets move and orbit their parent star. It's been observing for three years and has found more variable stars and more extrasolar planets than just we have up until this time, all the observatories put together, just this single satellite. Here is one planetary system it's found. It's got five planets in it going around a star like the Sun. They all orbit inside the Merc orbit of Mercury. It's found hundreds and hundreds of planetary candidates and hundreds of these solar systems with multiple planets in. But it's also good for doing astroseismology. When you take lots and lots of observations, as well as finding planets, you look at frequencies of stars. And this top one here is a star that we've got some sound of here. These are the frequencies of this top star. As it vibrates, there are various red giants and blue giants. It takes continuous light curves for years and years and years, and so has a wonderful sample. Oh, stop. Has a wonderful sample of frequencies of stars. So I'll just finish up by answering the question, what appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within? Well, it's astroseismology, the real music of the stars. It's how we tell what's inside stars. By looking at the way sound waves are initiated and propagate through the star, we can work out its internal structure. We can make 
accurate measurements of exactly what's going on. And so we can work out all sorts of things and all sorts of properties of the sun from doing that. And so I'll just finish up by showing a movie of an aurora. So here we have the internal structure of the sun. It's giving off a flare of charged particles. They're heading towards the Earth. It's a good thing we have a magnetic field. Those charged particles are funneled down to the north and south magnetic poles and create the aurora.